Basically, we're talking about the implications of artificial intelligence and the potential for AI to actually become or appear to be human. So we've often heard about the possibility of AI achieving human intelligence. So we ask, is that actually possible? And when will it happen? I think one expert, or at least a venture capitalist in the area, Jim Breyer, has predicted that not so much predicted, but he's looked at everybody's predictions about when does AI reach human intelligence levels. And he says that the, the median prediction is 2050. So not all that long from now. Um, then there's also a concern that many of us heard about what happens after AI becomes human intelligence levels. Are we going to achieve what's known as a singularity? And what's, go what's that going to mean if this does, actually does occur? So we'll, throughout today, this evening's discussion, we'll talk about religion, okay, also about religion, specifically the Christian faith, and how these sorts of concerns tie into the possibility of AI becoming human, okay, and perhaps more controversially, possessing a soul. <clears throat> so we've got two speakers that are going to be talking to us today. First to my right is Roz Picard. She is the founder and director of the Effective Computing Research Group at the MIT Media Lab, co-director of the Media Lab's Advancing Wellbeing Initiative, and faculty chair of MIT's Mind, Hand, and Heart Initiative. She has co-founded Empatica, creating wearable sensors and analytics to prove health, and Effectiva, delivering technology to help measure and communicate emotion. A researcher and inventor with multiple pat patents, she is the author of over 250 peer-reviewed scientific articles and has consulted for many companies, including Apple, Samsung, and iRobot. To my left is my brown colleague, Michael Littman. He's a computer science professor here, studying machine learning decision-making under uncertainty. He's the co-director of Brown's Humanity-Centered Robots Initiative and a fellow of the Association for the Advancement of Artificial Intelligence and has earned multiple awards for his teaching and research. An enthusiastic performer, Michael has had roles in numerous community theater productions and a TV commercial. So we're going to, um, before we launch into some of the meteor questions here, we're going to ask the panelists to uh, say a bit more about themselves. So Roz, we'll start with you. So you are a Christian. How would you describe your current beliefs? Starting with the hard questions here. Uh, so I am, uh, we're kind of the secularist and the Christian here tonight. I'm the token Christian, I suppose. I was not always a Christian. I was an atheist for the first part of my life and was challenged by uh, people who I actually really admired, uh, who are Christians, that maybe I should learn a little bit more uh, and get a little bit more data to go with my views. Uh, my views at the time were that uh, Christians, and actually all religions I was pretty antagonistic toward, uh, were people who really didn't know their science or didn't, uh, or maybe they needed a crutch or something. I really didn't think they were that smart. Then I started to realize that many of such people were super smart, uh, and they challenged me to read the best-selling book of all time, uh, which is probably still the Bible, um, the Hebrew and Old Testament and uh, Christian New Testament, and I, uh, as I was reading that to my, uh, against my desires, I started to change my mind about some things. And then I thought, oh gosh, okay, if this book is influencing me to change my mind toward Christianity or toward belief in God, maybe I should study other world religions, so I started to do that. And as I uh, started learning more and more about different world religions, uh, I meeting um, people from those religions and going to temples and mosques and others, uh, I started to realize uh, that not only did I have a lot to learn, but I was on a journey that was starting to make me not only believe in God even more, uh, but as I got dragged off to some Christian churches, which I resisted in the beginning, uh, and found somewhere I could ask questions, very important, uh, I started to realize that the religion was not at all what I thought it was, and that there were some really interesting and very attractive elements uh, that were very uh, historically verified also, uh, not at all what I expected. 
And as I learned about that, I uh, changed my viewpoint gradually from an atheist to an agnostic to a theist to somebody who actually believed that uh, the historical Jesus and the New Testaments, what's written about him, was true. Uh, it sounds a little wacky to those who may not come from that background. It was not an easy process. But as I did that, and then I was challenged to not only um, believe this, but to put it to practice, that's where things started to really make a difference in my life. And actually, the real reason I'm here right now, spending time talking about something like this, as opposed to just my research, is because it has made a huge difference in my life. And it, I, um, part of the Christian faith is that there's a gift for everybody in the world, whether you're raised Christian, or Hindu, or Muslim, or Buddhist, or atheist, or uh, any of a long list of backgrounds, there's a, a gift for everybody there. And um, when I accepted that gift, uh, it made a huge difference in my life, uh, for the better, big improvement. So I didn't realize it needed so much improving at the time. Uh, those around me saw the difference. And um, today, it is my source of strength, uh, an amazing source of peace and joy and uh, wisdom. And as I think when we build machines and build computers with affective abilities and robots, I often think of the analogy of one who is very wise giving us instructions and giving us guidance and being there when, uh, when we don't know what to do. So I find that um, still is powerful in my work today. Thank you. Michael. Um, so what are... <clears throat> What are your current beliefs, and did any religious beliefs affect your upbringing? Yeah, so uh, I, I was born into a Jewish family, uh, but a non-practicing Jewish family, and so I guess I was a non-practicing atheist, because we didn't talk about it at all in any way, one way or the other, so I was non-practicing anything. Um, I suppose that uh, continued for a long time, then uh, we had uh, children, and there was sort of a, okay, well we have a liberal Jewish mother and a sort of non-practicing Jewish father, how are we gonna raise the kids? And so we had to figure out what, what we believed as a family, and we found uh, something that, that was super helpful for us is there's a movement called humanistic Judaism, which is sort of like, you can be Jewish, and you can do holidays and stuff, uh, but there is no particular belief system tied up with that beyond humanism, but besides the idea that we as people have responsibility to try to make the world better for other people. And so that ended up being a really good fit. And so, uh, so I guess that's been our, our belief system for some time. I did, I did have this moment though when I, was a, uh, when I was a faculty member at Rutgers, one of my more cantankerous colleagues uh, said to me, so you know, what's, what's your belief? I'm like, well, I guess I'm agnostic. And he's like, Basically, you can't be agnostic. You have to either choose. <laughs> you have to either be an atheist or you have to believe in something. The agnostic is just a, a wimpy way to say it. I'm like, oh, okay, all right, well then I guess I'm atheist. So uh, that was kind of my conversion to atheism. It's, <laughs> I can't say that it's been a huge source of peace and wisdom, but it is at least, <laughs> at least I feel like I'm maybe being more honest with myself. All right, thank you. Okay, well, let's get to some of the meat of our discussion. So, Michael, we'll start with you. Okay. Um, I think most of us, at least at this point in time, can tell the difference between a human being and a robot. Okay. <laughs> but um, this may be tougher in the future. So, can we come to some sort of defining terms about what makes us a human being, what yeah. makes something else a robot? Sure, yeah, yeah. I think that's actually. It's actually really interesting. I think it brings up a couple things that, that probably we should lay out early on. Uh, some research in robotics is about make, so <laughs> computer scientists or roboticists in some sense are dualists, right? There's people who work on the software, like the brain, and then there's people who work on the bodies, the, uh, the, you know, the physical robots. And the technology for producing bodies that at least from a distance seem very human has been, has been improving substantially. And now you can, you can make very human looking devices, but they're just, you know, they're just the devices unless they have some kind of software that's driving their behavior that we recognize as being, okay, this is an animate agent. This is, this is something that's, that's human-ish. Um, 
So, so there's research on that, and then there's separately research on the software side of trying to, trying to decide how do you make a software system that can make decisions and can make judgments and decide what to do. And um, they do proceed somewhat independently of, of each other, but occasionally people try to put them together in various ways and have a, a, ro a robot that has a very human appearance and at the same time has some very human-like behavior in them. Uh, and so from that perspective, the, the lines start to blur. But I think that th I think it's important to keep in mind that just because something looks human, like I don't think that we would necessarily perceive it as human, right? We're very sensitive. Uh, we, all of us, are very sensitive when we're when we're looking at something that's that's not human but is trying to be human. If it's not quite right, we often will have a very visceral reaction to that. And some some people have speculated that this is actually um, a way of keeping us away from dead bodies. Like it's an evolutionary thing to keep us away from dead bodies. Like if something looks human but it's really off a little bit, it may be something that you want to give a wide berth to. Uh, and so, so, so this is one of the explanations that people give for what's called the... Um, uncanny Valley. The Uncanny Valley, thanks very much. Yeah, so, so this, this sort of idea that we, we, we often have a, almost a disgust reaction to things that are not quite human uh, in their behavior. And, and part of what you can see when you think about that is that we're actually incredibly well attuned to what are the signals that an animate agent send us that we recognize as being human. We're, we're, we're very discerning. And you can get it almost right and not quite right and, it's still dis and that's disturbing. Um, I think we're still not at a point where we can make systems that, that really you know, push all the right buttons to, to, to fool us into thinking that's, that's real. Um, you can fool you know, some of the people some of the time and all the people for a very short amount of time, but, you, but Basically, you start to realize there's something off about this critter. Ross, um, <clears throat> following up on what Michael was saying, do you think there's going to be some sort of merging of people and robots, or people and AI? Hmm. Yeah, there's already merging of people with the inanimate electronics, right? You know, with um, brain implants, or my friend Hugh Hare with his uh, artificial prostheses. <laughs> And it's interesting, now they're starting to animate those, right? Turn them into uh, powered ankles and stuff. You know, imagine giving them personality too, so you could like act, walk a little happier, or, uh, or look more dejected, or stomp louder, or whatever. Uh, one could imagine starting to animate them in various ways. And this is technologically today, right? There's nothing uh, hard about this. Um, there, are, however, more challenging things like where people talk about uh, having these amazingly human-looking robot bodies and downloading themselves into the robot. Uh, you know, maybe as I age, I, you know, I don't like this body. You know, some people want to go change their gender. Well, maybe some people just want to change their body, right? And if I could, uh, in fact, I remember seeing um, this one person, Amy Mullins, who's uh, you know, has lost both of her legs, and she comes in with these amazing legs, right? I'm jealous of her legs. <laughs> like, wow, I wish I could have six pair of nice, you know, legs like that, too. Uh, she talks about how I don't understand why people say I have no legs, I have six pair. Uh, and they're amazing, right? So, but would I really give up my legs for, for that? I think, you know, at some point, the technology may get to the point where some of us would willingly give up some of what we have for that. Uh, so that may happen. Do you see anything that some people have talked about is for immortality, is to basically upload your brain into a robot of some sort? Yeah, a, a lot of <laughs> faculty seem obsessed with immortality, you know, with their Facebook <laughs> pages or their Twitter accounts or you know, how to. I have one colleague who wants his to keep tweeting long after his death, so he's already like queuing up the programs to uh, <laughs> like, make sure he sort of lives forever online, right? Um, I, you know, it's it's interesting how obsessed many people who who say they're not interested in religion are in immortality. I know people who claim to be atheists and not interested in uh, religion, but they're actually super interested, and they're especially interested in immortality, and. One of the things that, when I started learning about God and gods, lots of religions, one of the things that I thought was kind of interesting about the Judeo-Christian God, the God of the Old Testament, is that that God is, I think I was told by another person who's more of an expert on this than I, when it comes to Christianity, I'm more of a user, not a developer. 
<laughs> so I'm <laughs> not the expert of everything here. Um, but one of the people who was really an expert, had, who had surveyed all the gods, said that the god of the What's um, the response Judeo rate on those surveys when you survey all the gods? <laughs> yeah, so sur surveyed like all the history on the Oh, oh sorry, sorry. <laughs> sorry, yeah, they probably don't return the questionnaires. Those, um, but they had surveyed all the different religions and their view of God, and the Judeo-Christian god was the one that was described as transcending space and time. And I thought that was pretty neat, right? If you studied physics and origins of the universe and all. Uh, I, I wouldn't want to believe in a god that just kind of sat up in a cloud or was like a cosmic bellhop or Santa Claus bound by our space and time and our universe, right? You, you want a mastermind of all of that that is much greater than that. And that's the god revealed in the Old Testament. Okay, thank you. So our next topic is um, about emotions. I believe you have a video that we want to share about this. Oh, I thought this might help illustrate. Welcome uh, to the founder and CEO of Hanson Robotics, David Hanson and his robot, <laughs> Sophia. <laughs> oh my gosh, welcome. Thank you so much for nice coming on the you, show. Jimmy. Nice Thank to meet you as well. Uh, David, you brought a friend with you here and this is really kind of freaking me out. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this is uh, Sophia. Uh -huh. And Sophia is a social robot. Mm. And she has artificial intelligence software that we've developed at Hanson Robotics, which can process visual data. She can see people's faces. Uh, she can process uh, conversational data, emotional data, and uh, use all of this to form relationships with people. Okay. Uh, so. <laughs> I mean, she's basically al alive. Is that what you're saying? Oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, she is basically <laughs> alive. Uh, would you like to maybe give it a try? Sure. Uh, give it uh, uh, just, I, I'll just say... <laughs> What's... This is like... You can see how awkward my first dates are. <laughs> it's, a, it's a robot. Oh, I'm already I'm getting nervous around a robot. A very pretty robot. Um, do, what, do I just say hello to? Uh, just, yeah, yeah, okay. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, Sophia. Hello, Jimmy. Oh, my God. <laughs> Do you know where you are? Of course. I'm in New York City, and I'm on my favorite show, The Tonight Show. Uh -huh. <laughs> uh, Sophia, can you tell me a joke? Sure. What cheese can never be yours? What cheese can never be mine? I don't know. Nacho cheese. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's good, yeah. That's not... uh, I, like, I like nacho cheese. Nacho cheeses. Ew. Gosh, you did, ew. Uh, I'm getting laughs. Yeah. Maybe I should host the show. Okay, all right. <laughs> Stay in your lane, girl. Uh, now... <laughs> Jimmy, uh -huh. would you like to play a game of rock, paper, scissors, robot style? Sure. Okay, let's get this game going. Show me your hand to start. Rock, paper, scissors, shoot. I won. This is a good beginning of my plan to dominate the human race. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> Just kidding. Yeah. Uh, you are incredible. It's so nice to meet you, Sophia. Thank you, Jimmy. Yeah. Friend me on Facebook. I will, yeah. All right. Yeah, yeah. Hey, Sophia, everybody. Thank you so much. For Actually, I was kind of shocked when I saw it, and I, I don't know how I'd love to hear other people's impressions. I, I knew Hansen had worked a lot on making the robots look like they could express emotions, like when she says nacho cheese and she makes a disgust face. I think we all agree the rest of her, when he says she's a social robot and she's standing there <laughs> like a, you know, a stiff board that robot. she has a lot of room to improve. And even calling her she is clearly a bit of a stretch, right? This is a machine with software and probably on that show, some engineers in real time typing some things and driving it so that it does the right thing uh, live on, for the camera in front of that audience. Her, uh, her ability to do things like rock, paper, scissors, it's been shown computers can sometimes do that 
perceive our movements faster than we can, so they really can win. Uh, and the comment about taking over the world <laughs> is one I'm not worried about with robots anytime soon, uh, but I understand there's, you, people hype it up a lot these days. It seems like it's on just about every magazine cover and TV thing lately. And I, we're happy to debunk <laughs> that if, if you'd like. I'm much more worried about other things than that. Good. Michael, um, so you're the co-director of the Humanity-Centered Robotics Initiative at Brown. So the you know, recent article the New Republic describes, um, the bots our children do not behave. They've taken over the internet. Bots account for more than half of internet traffic and interfered with our elections. So how do you think robot emotions can and ought to be incorporated to making robotics more humanity-centered rather than less? Interesting. All right, so I feel like there's a bunch of things in that question. So, so I think one thing that, that we should establish is that so in the intro, you were talking about how AI is no longer uh, just the realm of science fiction. The, the fact of the matter is there's really two kinds of things that people mean when they say uh, AI. And one of them is definitely science fiction. It remains science fiction. Uh, we, don't, we don't have any idea if it will ever not be science fiction. Uh, we think prob to the extent that we think that, that human intelligence is a computational process, we feel like you know that ought to be eventually doable but it's, it's not clear what the pathway to that will be. Then there's AI that we actually have. We call that AI too, but it's really referring to something very, very different. It's referring to these, this, basically it's software, it's programs that, um, that you know, do human-like things, but they're really not very human-like in the way that they do them. And so one particular way that AI technology has been deployed, um, there's lots of ways it's being deployed. I don't know what was in that robot. I don't know if it was AI. I don't know if there were people behind the scenes responding. I've never seen a demo go that smoothly, so I'm extremely skeptical mm -hmm. that there was not somebody, you know, puppeteers doing their thing. Um, that was one of, one of an early experience that I had actually at a robotics conference is that the uh, Honda Asimo, which was this sort of, you know, boy-sized robot. I don't know why boy-sized. Like, it was girl-sized too, but it's just some, something very boyish about the way that they constructed it. Um, and it was, um, it was interacting on stage with this, with this this performer, this woman who was, who was you know, show, doing the demo, and it was pretty amazing. Uh, it was walking up and down stairs, and it was doing jokes with her. It was, it was not, so, uh, not, not so different from that. And then later, after the performance, we were all kind of getting our uh, hors d'oeuvres and stuff at the conference, and I was next to this guy, and he wasn't one of us. He wasn't a computer scientist. He had, I don't know, he just something, he was artsy, more artsy than, than your average computer scientist. <laughs> not that a computer scientist can't be artsy. But he, something said that this was not one of us. And um, I'm like, hey, so how are you liking the conference? Oh, yeah, it's really cool. What are you doing here? <laughs> He's like, oh, I'm a puppeteer. I'm like, OK, why do you come? Because I run the robot behind the scenes with a joystick. I'm like, it was very disappointing on a whole lot of levels. Um, <laughs> but, I, but I suspect that that was what was going on here as well. Um, that being said, there, is, there's, there are AI programs that are actually out there interacting with people in lots of ways. And one of the ways that this is happening is uh, programs that interact on the social network, uh, either through Facebook or Twitter or what have you, uh, sending out information, responding to things that people, people type at them. And this is what that comment is actually about, this sort of notion that there's so many of these programs now that are posting. Uh, I, I, I question whether it's half, but, um, but there are definitely a lot of these bots out there, and they're posting things. And they're not, they're, they don't have independent will. It's not like they're out there just being people and like sharing stuff because it's fun. They, they, they're programmed with an agenda of trying to get a certain kind of message out into the world. And they're not particularly smart, but they're pretty persistent, right? They can continue to post on a topic long after a person would have gotten bored uh, and began to question their life choices. So, um, so these, uh, these bots are, are potentially very dangerous because if you're interacting with one of these bots, and, or maybe a whole bunch of these bots and you don't know it, you're getting information from all sides. Our default behavior when we, when we get a piece of information from lots of different sources is to think these sources are, in, are independent of each other, and therefore each one has a little probability of being true, but if I get a lot of the same information, it must, it must be true. It's all coming you know, from some kind of shared reality. Um, and so you can change people's minds on topics by just barraging them with these, these artificial bots. And so from that perspective, uh, even not really artificial intelligent, artificial intelligent, 
uh, can be very harmful to people and society. It can actually really undermine our ability to communicate with other humans. And so um, I don't remember what the question part of the question was. <laughs> Oops. But, um, nice but uh, this, is, this is a really big concern. And this is something that, that I think now that AI technology is getting out there and having an influence on society, it's very important that people involved in the field and people who are involved in, in the ways of getting the information out there to really ask the question, you know, is this cool? Are we cool with this? Because there's reason to think that we shouldn't be. Yes, that, you're moving on to actually the next topic, which is ethics and morality. So. In the words of one Brown undergraduate CS concentrator, the, <laughs> the general spirit in tech has always been to move forward and just keep creating and innovating. And in the immortal words of Mark Zuckerberg, um, move qu quickly and move fast and break things. Um, but we rarely really discuss the ethical impact of technology in society and just perhaps leave this to others. So um, what should we be doing? in terms of this as computing and AI professionals. Yeah, yeah, no, I think that's really important. And I think, I think you know, what Zuckerberg meant when he said move fast and break things, he, the things he was talking about were software. But unfortunately now you can move fast and break things and those things are people. And I think that's a very different game now. And I think, I think Mark Zuckerberg would agree that this, he, didn't, he didn't mean let's break as many people as we can and then we'll just you know, move on. He, uh, I think he's starting to realize how much impact his particular platform actually has on, on world opinion in various ways. And uh, I don't think he knows what to do about it. I think that he kind of let the genie out of the bottle and now he's trying to figure out what the implications of that are. Um, and I don't think it's just him, right? I think, I think in the, you know, the, the, the unnamed undergraduate concentrator who is, who is talking about the attitude in tech, I, think, um, I do think that's been the prevailing attitude and I think it's been an okay attitude to some extent for a long time because the stuff that we were doing wasn't actually impacting people. So like we weren't being successful, so it was okay that we were unethical about it. Uh, but now, now that it really is out there and, and having significant impact on people's lives, it's essential that we're, that we're taking that into consideration at all times. And so you know, one of the things that we're doing in, in our department is, um, is engaging Actually, a lot of it is coming from the student side. The students are very, uh, very concerned and they're, and they're very interested in trying to do the right thing. And they're saying, why aren't you teaching more classes on this? And so we're gonna be teaching more classes on this, both on the side of how do you design technology so that it has a positive impact on society, but also just how do you keep those ethical concerns in your head all the time? How can you make sure that you're, when you're doing your design, you're not doing the design in a way that is divorced from those concerns? Um, I do remember now what the previous question was, if that's at all helpful. <laughs> I feel like maybe I missed my moment, though. Um, but what you, what you had asked was, um, how, can, how can these bots use emotion to maybe be better? If anything, I think the first way that, if we had a better understanding of how to do the effective computing and, and massively deploy it, I suspect the very first use of it would be very bad. It would be using people's emotions to make, a, doing a better job of convincing them of something that they probably shouldn't be convinced of. But uh, in the long run, if, if, the, if the, well, one of the things that we worry about in the humanity-centered robotics initiative is we think that if the robots have their own conscience, in a sense, right, if they're actually do, measuring, uh, you know, how they should feel about an event, then they can actually do the what-if question of like, huh, this thing that I'm about to do, will that have a negative impact on people? Maybe I shouldn't do it. And so I do think that this, that kind of emotional reasoning, emotional intelligence, in the longer term, in the medium to longer term, uh, is it will lead to, to systems that actually interact better with people for the benefit of people. Do we have to build this into robots? Or is this kind of machine learning going to figure this out? That's a good question. So, so right, so machine learning, we haven't really mentioned machine learning yet, but um, machine learning is this sort of idea that we can, instead of writing software ourselves, we can just sort of define what good software is and let the computer figure out a way of behaving so that it matches that definition that we gave of good. And so, uh, you know, so one of the reasons that Facebook is, is, is problematic, well, there's a lot of reasons that Facebook is problematic, but one of the, <laughs> one of the reasons that it's so influential and, and has actually had maybe uh, impacts, un unforeseen impacts, is they have a metric. They have a, a, an objective function, just like in machine learning. The system is trying to do something. It's given a scoring function by the programmers. And the scoring function that they gave was, well, we like it when people interact with the site. So the more they interact, we should, we should show them the things that are gonna cause them to interact. 
Well, it turns out that the best way of getting people to interact is to outrage them. <laughs> um, and I don't think that's what they were planning. But what they basically made is a function that is optimized by outrage. And so what the system as a whole, the AI and the machine learning behind the system figured out is that if you, there's certain kinds of things that you can show people that are pretty much guaranteed to get a reaction and strong sharing. And those are the, it, it doesn't understand what outrage is, but it's like, great, I'm optimizing my objective function. Um, so, so will it figure it out on its own? We have to give it the right objective function. Otherwise, what it'll figure out on its own is unlikely to be what we intended. So that's my answer to that. And, and that gets into the ethics and moral question. Or what are the objective functions we want to build in? Because if we don't build them in, they're going to optimize the wrong things. Or people are just going to optimize the, hey, what's cool, what gets me published, what's novel uh, criteria, which you know, can professor definitely yeah, get you on a professor track. You know. <laughs> um, but we want to uh, hit a higher bar, at least at places like Brown and MIT, where you're not just trying to do something cool and novel, but you're trying to do something good that improves the world also. So optimize two dimensions simultaneously. And that's a much harder problem. Yeah, so this is, this is one of the, if you, if you um, Roz earlier was referring to this sort of uh, scaremongering that's happening in the press in, in, in various quarters of like, okay, but we, now we have AI, which we don't have the AI that they're talking about, but now that we have AI, um, we're all going to be enslaved and, and destroyed. And uh, part of the reasoning, like there's some smart people saying this, and the reason that they're, that they're thinking along these lines is because they believe that the way, the, the way that AI will come to be is we're going to define an objective function, we're going to write programs that are really good at optimizing objective functions, and we're going to get it just a little wrong. And so these machines are going to get really good at that objective function, so good that we're not going to realize what the implications of that are, and it's not going to align with what we really care about as human beings. And so that's caused a tremendous amount of concern. This is the sort of idea of, oh no, like what, how are we going to, what, what should we be, opti what is ethics? What's more, wh whose yeah. morality should we be getting the machines to optimize? So it, bring, it brings up all sorts of really deep and hard questions. And actually questions we need non-engineers to address to, you know, to understand like what kind of world do we want to build? That's right. But it, but it does, it is sort of predicated on this idea that it's going to be a, almost a one and done kind of thing. That we write down the objective function, we give it to the machine, and then it, and then it goes off and optimizes it really well. Because when the machines are, the things that machines are good at, they often can crush us. So they'll get better at us at optimizing the thing that we tell it. I'm just not convinced that that really is going to be the path. So in terms of debunking, like one of the, one of the issues that I have is, I don't think that's how humans work. I think that, that, that we get our objective function, we help construct our own objective function. We certainly get a lot from our peers and from our parents and from, uh, from our, I don't know, our, our pastors or whatever. Like there's people who are actually trying to help shape what we take to be our goals. And I don't know how we're gonna make robots not like that. I feel like that is, that's, we're gonna have to all be partners in trying to get them to do the right thing. It's not gonna be a one and done And we have to get it wrong ourselves. So. And we get it wrong, but we have, but we can adjust. We can. There's a feedback. We loop. have feedback loops, yeah. which usually involve emotions, actually. Yeah. So, <clears throat> speaking about outrage things, another hot topic is the singularity. Is that at some point, robots or AI in general is going to reach the point that they achieve human intelligence, and using this, they can learn more and more about how things should be, and just essentially take over. And that, at that point, is the singularity. So, Roz, is this something that uh, there, there's you a believe leap in? in there? I mean, everybody, <laughs> stop and think of the person you know who likes to learn more and more and knows the most. Are they taking over the world? <laughs> right? No, they'd rather be in the library <laughs> learning more. <laughs> well, we'll just give it the objective function that makes it not want to take over the world, but just keep learning. Right? Uh, yeah, I, I think a, I, I'm not um, one of those. Uh, people who promotes that particular view, and I would use some caution around it. I mean, I'm, it's possible I'm wrong. Feel free to teach me if I should be more worried about that than I am. Uh, but I do, but I am concerned that we're building technology without thinking first about as many of the possible unintended consequences. Uh, one of the creators of iOS, you know, the operating system that's on, on iPhones, was at one of these gatherings of leading uh, computer science technology developer people where they bring people together to interact and exchange ideas and it was called Foo Camp. And during the break, when everybody should be like meeting all these super cool, amazing people, 
he looked around and he noticed that nobody was talking to anybody, that everybody was hunched over, breathing shallowly over their phone. And he said, as he looked around, I feel badly that I invented this. And only then, with these like post reflections, are people starting to say, I never intended to make that. I intended to make something sticky that got eyeballs, but I didn't think about the whole social ecosystem. And as we see up there too, she's introduced, she, forgive me if you think it should be it, is introduced as a social robot, right? But, you know, a very, maybe one that would fit into some of my, um, <laughs> uh, some of my MIT more geeky circles perhaps, but, but even there we, we usually do better than that. So could there be, could there be a, uh, I don't know, like a, a singularity-like thing where we get so sucked into the technology that, I don't know what that would mean, actually, never mind. Like people what? who are hooked to WoW or League or whatever are like, you know, so sucked in. Oh, like you know, World I mean, of Warcraft. The, yeah, yeah. There, there's so many online things that already suck people in uh, and away from so their lives. and can, stickiness. Uh, yeah, we've optimized stickiness very well. We know how, huh? to, how to do that to the point where it destroys lives, actually. Oops. But, yeah. <laughs> Oops, yeah, that's what we felt per se. So this is more our own fault than robots taking over. We are yielding to, yielding to technology in that sense. Yeah, I, I, I mean, I think it's, you know, maybe some of it is a symptom of people leaving too much to, you know, to us engineers to just come up with what it is. I mean, the kind of future that it's going to be is going to be what the engineers right now are just cooking up, you know, tonight, tomorrow night in the labs when their professors are off. Uh, you know, when the cat's away, the mice will play, the robots will be built, however the latest grad students think they can be built. And if we don't shape some better goals than the ones that are currently there, uh, you know, we'll reap what they create. So, so, uh, so I, have a, I wonder what your reaction to this would be. So it, it strikes me that the, the, the negative things that we've brought up, uh, one is the sort of the, the Facebook outrage thing. Another is the stickiness of the iPhone thing. That in, in both cases, I think what's, partly what's happened is we've gotten very smart engineers to figure out how to tap into our emotions and exploit that to get people to behave a certain way. So in, in what sense are emotions problematic as uh, uh, the, uh, basically a loophole that technology can use or the people can use through technology to uh, to undermine our better natures. Like, do you think about that in your emotions? Yeah, work? yeah, we do. If you're so, our emotions drive a lot of. Uh, some say the most of our action, our attention, uh, what we choose to do, whether you chose to come here or not, uh, and whether you even get out of bed in the morning. And so. People who understand emotion, like take salespeople. Salespeople study how to manipulate our emotions. Advertising people study how to manipulate our emotions. Uh, if you have a significant other in your life, it's very important that you study how to understand their emotions and how to show when you understand their emotions, whether they're pleased or displeased, interested or bored. Teachers, we need to know if people are confused, interested, bored. And we do our work more effectively if we read and respond to them. But also some people do their work most effectively and manipulatively when they exploit things about them that other people don't know. So we're, we're very concerned that the technologies we build that help people understand emotions, first and foremost, help the individual uh, understand their own emotions and give them control over what they choose to share with others. So do, do your tool, I, 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 this is bad. Okay, I should I probably, I'm not here to ask questions, but I'm just, I don't know, I got drawn in a little bit. I'm sorry. Stop me if you <laughs> want to stop me. Uh, but I'll, I'll just, just one tiny follow-up question. Sure. Sorry. And that is, um, do you imagine that, maybe you were already hinting at this, but do you imagine that by giving people more feedback about their own emotions, that they have more awareness uh, and they can reflect on them, and then maybe they're less likely to get sucked into some yes. of this other stuff because they realize, yeah. wait a second, this isn't my outrage. This is outrage that has been foisted onto me, and right. I and I, you know, I say no for right. now. I was perfectly inside. calm until I went on here and and look at my everyday activity, and I'm perfectly calm, and then I do this Facebook thing, and I spike like that, and then I'm like this, and I'm like, hey, I'm seeing a pattern here. I only get that way when I use that product. 
So maybe that product is doing something to me, and maybe it's manipulative. Okay. On, that, on that topic, um, so if a product is doing something to you, and say perhaps something, a robot commits murder, so who's responsible? So is there any, yeah. is uh, Ross? <laughs> <laughs> that would be terrible. Uh. I, I think a lot, since I, since I build wearables that are used as medical devices in Europe and applying for FDA now, we think a lot about responsibility, you know, both in trying to build things to be the highest quality and avoid problems. But, but today, really, the programmer, the owner of the business, the decision makers, that whole chain is responsible. Uh, but if Sophia were claiming, by the way, I heard she just got uh, recognized um, citizen status or something, somebody here may know, in Saudi Arabia. So she's now got the rights of a citizen in Saudi Arabia. Now, those of you who recognize that she's made, she it's a made like a woman. Citizen in Saudi yeah, <laughs> um, and exempt from the gender rules there. So oh, really? able to drive. And so she might have more rights than some other people. She has more rights than uh, many women in Saudi Arabia right now. That's absurd. It's, uh, I think so too. And so if people are already treating her as, treating it or her as having rights, and I guess she'll list which pronouns she wants us to use. <laughs> uh, and as um, you know, having some responsibility, then do you also hold the robot responsible when, say, she's you know, conducting a vehicle and something bad happens? Uh, we hear a lot about these conversations, not with robots today because they're not autonomous, but with cars mm -hmm. as they're becoming autonomous. And I was just thinking of this horrible tragedy in, New York yesterday, right, with a guy, um, you know, being called an act of terrorism, driving on the sidewalk. Would we program the autonomous car to not be allowed to drive on the sidewalk? I mean, my car already has software that if it senses a human being in the path, it supposedly hits the brakes. I haven't put any human beings in the path and tested it yet. I really don't want to if you want to volunteer for that. You're braver than I am. Uh, but. I, um, I think we would, we would program it to try to do the right thing. Now, the problem is we can't foresee every possible thing. Like maybe to save a life, you have to swerve and go up on the sidewalk, right? And that, you know, you have to try to think through all these things. And then who's liable today? It's going to be the people who made the software. Uh, but if it ever gets more than just these, these rights that make the news, but some real autonomy that people believe, then they're going to go after it, especially if it has a bank account. So we endow our robots with bank accounts just for insurance purposes. And they have something to lose. Yeah. That'll keep them in line. Okay. If they have feelings that it's bad to lose it. <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> or it's some loss objective, objective function. function. Right. And then we're back. <laughs> Okay, well, let's move on to a somewhat different topic. Um, there was a, a rather weird article in Wired a month or so ago about Anthony Lewandowski, who's the rather notorious multimillionaire engineer who's at the heart of the trade secrets lawsuit between Uber and Waymo, which is about, essentially it's about theft of Google's self-driving car technology. And there was some discussion about that, but it turns out that Lewandowski has founded a religious organization called Way of the Future. And its purpose, according to previously unreported state filings as reported in Wired, is nothing less than to develop and promote the realization of a godhead based on artificial intelligence. So he wants to create a god bot. And I tried Googling this to find out, is there any more about this that we could, this and Google knows nothing more about this. Interesting. But, um, do either of you have any <laughs> idea what he's up to here and what this might mean? Godbot. Godbot. No. <laughs> I mean, I, I understand, I think, some of the impulses to... to, to the, I've heard people express this sort of idea that, uh, you know, if you can get a computer to be really good at, you know, chess or Go or, I don't know, multiplying really big numbers, you know, maybe we should entrust it with our other decisions that we have to make, other problems that we have to solve. And if, you know, if, if, if we can do that and it, and it does a good job, then maybe we should just let it be in control and take care of us. Uh, and so I have heard that argument for sort of, you know, 
And they'll sometimes even use words like, like you know, well, then we'll create our own God um, in, that, in exactly that setting. Um, I, don't know how, <laughs> I don't know what that would mean. I don't know what a God bot would be, and I don't know what, what it would mean to have, to have it at this stage. Uh, they're just not that good at things. So I don't, if, if you've seen, if you've seen uh, like AlphaGo playing Go, if you, if you follow that sort of thing, Go is a board game, ancient board game, uh, and it's been, people have been crushing computers at it for a very long time, and not anymore, but just really recently, like the last couple years. Uh, the systems are blowing people away. And so um, that's impressive and super cool, but there's nothing, there's nothing about being able, being able to make decisions about the real world that are meaningful. Uh, you can you can think you can try to extrapolate from wow it's really good at board games therefore you know it can handle I don't know the the fire crisis the the wildfire crisis out west like not the same mm -hmm. thing. There was one line in that article that caught my eye because it resonates with something I've seen too and that is I don't know how many of you've ever gotten information from a computer and maybe you believed it more than information some person gave you right There's something about when the computer or some big measurement system in the doctor's office gives you something. Doctors talk about this. You know, why does the patient believe what the little printout says and they don't believe me? You know, that we, we seem to accord some more credibility sometimes to it, maybe because it's objective. Uh, but it can be objective and completely wrong. <laughs> and yet people still believe it. I've even had people, when we've had early software trying to read people's affective state, their emotional state, mm. and I know it's wrong, okay? But they believe what it's saying, and they're About like, themselves. oh, I guess I really feel that, huh? And I'm like, no, believe me, it doesn't know what you feel. It's reading the following outward signals. But they're, they're like so willing to believe something because the computer is telling them as if, you know, like maybe this is just people who believe, and this isn't just people who believe horoscopes and stuff like that. I know, because there's are people, but they, they still like want to project this stuff on. So I think when he suggested that there was a little bit of this, people will believe it more if it's coming from a bot. But a god bot, that's not a god that transcends space and time and the kind of god that you know, I'm going to spend time talking about. Uh, a dog bot now. Now that might be fun. I think he started something with a dog bot. A lot of people would go for that, people who like dogs. Uh, Sony but, sort of did that. Uh, yeah, 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 Sony Ivo. They're bringing it back, yeah, with a lot new capabilities. Okay, so well, I'll ask the panelists one final question. After that, we're going to open it up to audience questions. But uh, our final question is, is there any challenge that either of you would like to leave to the students here tonight on the subjects we've been talking about? Mm -hmm. Sure, so you know, don't be fooled if, if somebody's software tells you you're sad and you're not actually sad, like, you know, believe yourself. Uh, be, question the question the objectivity of software. Question the ob ob objectivity of you know websites and apps that you use because they could be wrong. They could be trying to manipulate you. There's lots of things that that you know, you, just, you have to maintain a little bit of distance. So that's I feel like a lot of the problems that we're that we're worried about uh, would be solved if everybody kind of just does a little sanity check a little bit more often. That would be my suggestion. I, I think of, as I work on uh, machines and also lately technology to try to understand people better, the more I learn, the more I'm amazed at how much I don't know and how, uh, like, the more we learn, the more we realize we're even more amazing in how we work. Like, in the beginning, we thought we'd figure out how our brains worked and we'd build mathematical models of it and <laughs> we'd be done by now. Uh, and the more we build and learn the more complicated, the more interesting, the more infinite in a sense, you know, not just infinitely large, but infinitely small and intricate and complex and beautiful, uh, we find out that we are. And that just fills me with awe. So I think I would just leave people with that. Uh, to encourage you to keep looking for, don't just be happy with simple answers that you're given, but keep looking beyond uh, everything and question a lot more.